start getting into our material. All right, can everybody see the little PowerPoint I have up? Yes. All right, very good. So this week you are working on learning everything about blood vessels and blood pressure. That's what your goal is for this week. What is the structure of the blood vessels? What are arteries? What are veins, right? What are capillaries? More than that, on the practical, you're gonna to have to be able to identify the arteries located in different parts of the body, the veins that are located in different parts of the body. All of that material is either in your pre and post lab assignments and or in my models book or the Quizlets that I made. And again, if you come across something that you're having trouble with, take a screenshot of it and email it to me and I'll help you with it. So let's go over basically what arteries and veins are in the body. I mean, you, you, you guys pretty much know what they are, but what classifies an artery relative to a vein and vice versa? Well, this first picture you see here obviously is an artery, labeled artery, and there are some structural differences between arteries and veins. Before I get to those differences, let me tell you how we define them. Arteries are defined as blood vessels that carry blood away from the heart. So all the blood vessels in the body that are carrying blood away from the heart to a tissue somewhere in the body is called an artery. Veins are all of the blood vessels in the body that are draining blood away from a tissue and carrying it back to the heart. So arteries carry blood away from the heart, veins carry blood back to the heart from a tissue. Capillaries are the smallest of the cardiovascular vessels in the body. Their structure is fairly simple, although there are some structural differences between the types of capillaries in the body. We're not covering that in here. Um, capillaries are pretty simple. All cardiovascular vessels in the body are aligned on the inside by a simple squamous epithelium, which is referred to as an endothelium since it's inside of a vessel. So this is just simple squamous epithelium you learned about in AMP1. It lines the inside of a capillary, which you see down here. It lines the inside of an artery and the inside of a vein. Capillaries are the simplest of uh, vessel structures. It's made of the endothelium and a very thin basement membrane. And the reason why it's very thin walled is because this is where the capillaries are where the majority of all the nutrients and waste go from the blood to a tissue cell and from the tissue cell back into the blood. That's called capillary exchange. So water and nutrients and waste and oxygen and CO2, medicines, hormones that we talked about, all go back and forth across the, the capillary wall to and from a tissue. Now, arteries and veins are more complex in structure. They have actual layers of tissue structure that make them up. There are three basic layers that make up arteries and veins as far as the wall is concerned. There's something called the tunica interna. The tunica interna is made up of the endothelium. Just on the outside of the endothelial lining is the basement membrane. And at least in arteries, arteries have more elastic connective tissue than veins do. There's a layer of elastic connective tissue that is called the internal elastic lamina. So notice that uh, veins have very little elastic tissue. There is some there, they're not labeling it, but it's very little compared to an artery. So the first layer of elastic tissue in an artery is called the internal elastic lamina. Lamina just means layer. So that's the first layer. That's the innermost layer of the wall of, of a vessel. The middle layer, which is thicker in an artery than it is in a vein. The middle layer is made up of predominantly smooth muscle. It's called the tunica media. So there's more smooth muscle in the wall of an artery than a comparably sized vein of the same size. So there's less muscle tissue in the wall of a vein 
that's the same size at least. You can't compare a large vein to a small artery and vice versa. But in the same sized vessel, less smooth muscle in the tunica media than in the artery. We also have another layer of elastic connective tissue, at least in some of the larger arteries, and that's called the external elastic lamina. So these elastic layers allow the arteries to be somewhat elastic. That means they can bound outward a little bit and they bound back inward. They're elastic, all right? They can stretch and then bounce back to their original shape. The outermost layer of a vessel wall is called a tunica externa. This is dense connective tissue you learned about in AMP1 in the tissue chapter, and it surrounds the outside of arteries and veins. It's called the tunica externa. Now, one, one marked difference that you can see right away besides the thickness of the walls of an artery and a vein is that veins have these valves in them. Veins have valves in them, but arteries don't. Right, so that's a major structural difference. And the reason for that is because the blood pressure in an artery is always higher than the blood pressure in a vein. So since veins have lower pressure, they have these one-way valves so that when we contract our skeletal muscles, skeletal muscles squeeze around the vein and it forces increases pressure inside the vein forces a valve open and blood is moved along the vein because of what's called venous return. And I'm going to mention some of that again in a minute. Now in the packet, you're going to see several, when you go look at it online, you have to be connected to the internet, but a couple of the slides have these links in it. These are some pretty cool animations. I, I think they're, they're pretty good. You should review them. That's why I left them in here. So you can just go in there and click on it and go through the little tutorial on is it. it's not really difficult, um, but it's a pretty good review, all right? All right, so last week we talked about the heart and we talked about cardiac output. Oh, go ahead. What's lumen? Oh, um, I'm glad you asked that because we have to talk about that in a minute. All right, so the lumen is an open area. So the inside of a blood vessel where blood is flowing is the lumen of the blood vessel. Inside your stomach, so you eat food, your food goes to your stomach, everybody knows that. The open space in the stomach where your food goes is the lumen of the stomach. So basically a lumen is an open space. It just depends on, here we're talking about blood vessels. In your, like the lumen of your urinary bladder is where urine is stored until you go to the bathroom. Does that make sense now? Yeah. All right, very good. All right, so also um, when you guys have a question, just unmute. And then I'll answer the question. Just go ahead and mute your mic back so we don't get feedback. All right. All right. So uh, last week we talked about cardiac output. We have to discuss it briefly again today because cardi since we're dealing with blood pressure and blood flow in this week's exercises, we have to know a little bit about cardiac output. So if you missed last week, I'm going to hint on this again today and the parameters that affect cardiac output. So before we dive into that, let's talk about blood flow. Blood flow through the body and through the tissues in the body. So what is that? Well, total blood flow in our body is the total volume of blood that passes through a system or a tissue in some given period of time, which typically we say one minute. So the volume of blood that passes through a tissue in one minute would be considered blood flow. Now, I might have failed to mention this last week when we talked about the heart, but total blood flow in our body at rest, when you're sitting down or lying down, you're not running on a treadmill, but when you're, when you're at rest, total blood flow 
equals cardiac output at rest. So what is cardiac output? Well, cardiac output is a total blood flow through the heart into the system every minute, which was calculated by how many times a minute the heart beats, which is heart rate, times how much blood is pumped out of the heart on each beat, which is stroke volume. So cardiac output equals how much blood is pumped out on each beat times the amount of times the heart beats. And that volume is your total blood volume at rest. So for instance, the average blood volume in a male is five to six liters. An average male is five to six liters of blood. And an average female is four to five liters. So let's say you have five liters of blood in your body, total blood volume in the body. What is cardiac output at rest? Well, it's going to be four liters because your heart, if everything's working correctly, pumps your total blood volume in one minute at rest. Now that goes up if you're running on a treadmill. It can go up four to five times your total blood volume, cardiac output can, if you're working out. But what I'm referring to is your at rest cardiac output. So basically what I'm saying is, if you could trace a drop of blood from the right atrium of the heart, and then have it go all through the heart to the lungs, back to the heart, through the heart, out to the body, to your big toe, and all the way back to the right atrium. That one drop of blood would take one minute to travel the entire distance of the body. Because your heart pumps your total blood volume in one minute at rest. So I hope that makes sense a little bit. That's fascinating. Yeah. So, yeah, it's so interesting. Well, we're about to get into this because it, and I, I'm glad whoever said that because it reminded me to tell you this. On the physiology test, <clears throat> there's going to be some questions about the parameters that make cardiac output go up. So what does, why does the cardiac output go up when you're running on a treadmill relative to as if you're just lying down on a couch? Well, I'm going to revisit those parameters today. If you, if you forgot them or you, you really need some refresher on it, or if you missed last week, we're about to go back over all those parameters. So yeah, at rest, our heart pumps our total blood volume. But when you start running on that treadmill, your heart has the ability to pump up to four to five times your total blood volume in one minute. That's amazing. If you think about it, your heart can pump that four to five liters four or five times that four to five liters. So it can pump up to 20 to 25 liters in a minute. How crazy is that, right? All right, so. Um, sir, I have a quick question. Go ahead. Um, I, I don't remember if it was in lab or lecture, but I came across a question that um, asked me whether the resting heart rate in an athlete in a um, normal healthy person that's a non-athlete correct is the same it's not the same in an athlete i don't have the the power the powerpoint would be from last week um in an athlete so i could i could describe it here on this on this here's how simple this is look at cardiac output is going to equal your heart rate times your stroke volume right now if what I said is true, where your heart, your cardiac output at rest is your total blood volume being pumped out of the heart every minute, then these two parameters are exactly what changes in order to pump your total blood volume. In other words, when you jump on a treadmill, your heart rate's gonna go up. It's gonna make your cardiac output go up. If you jump on a treadmill, your the force of contraction of the heart also increases which makes it pump out more blood. So your stroke volume is going to go up. Now let's consider an athlete and an average person at rest. Their heart has to pump their total blood volume in one minute at rest. So how does, and I'll just let you know this, a trained athlete typically has a lower resting heart rate than an average individual because they're conditioned, they're trained. 
So consider this formula. If an athlete has a lower resting heart rate than an average individual, but yet their heart still has to pump the same volume of blood as that average individual, how can that be? If their heart rate is lower, well, look at the formula. If it is true that the cardiac output has to be the total blood volume, but this number is lower than average, it goes to show that this number has to be higher. So and, and a trained athlete has a lower resting heart rate because their heart is conditioned to where on each beat, it automatically contracts a little bit harder. So on each beat, they pump out a little bit more blood, which means their stroke volume is higher than the average individual. So if the stroke volume is higher, that means your, your resting heart rate can be a little bit lower and you would still have the same number. For instance, let's say that the numbers are two. Heart rate is two, stroke volume is two. And the average individual, the heart has to pump two times a minute and the stroke volume is two, and then you get four. Your cardiac output is four, right? Well, in a trained athlete, we could say this heart rate can be one. But in order for this number to still be four, this number has to be four. So this number has to go up. So in a trained athlete, their heart actually contracts harder than an average individual. So a trained athlete pumps out more blood on each beat so they can beat fewer times a minute to get their resting cardiac output. So does that make sense to whomever asked the question? Because I can't see y'all's names anymore. Yeah, um, so it's Baksha. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Very good. Yeah, that, so that's where that comes from. All right. All right. So, um, so we have to know this formula again. Uh, that was introduced last week, right? So it's obviously going to be important today as well because we're going over blood pressure and cardiac output is one of two things that brings about pressure. So um, I left this link in here. You, should, you guys should go click on that and review it. It's a pretty good simple animation dealing with uh, cardiac output and the regulation of vascular uh, resistance and all of that, which we're getting into today. So let's talk about blood pressure a little bit. Everybody knows the term blood pressure, right? Heard of that a million times. But if somebody asked you to write down a definition as to what blood pressure is, could you do it? Of course, we kind of know what it is, but can you, if you physically had to write out a definition of what blood pressure is, could you do it? And I'm sure you could come up with something, right? So let me just say, let me just say that pressure, blood pressure, is the force of blood that is exerted on the inside of the wall of a blood vessel as the blood moves through the blood vessel. It's the force that blood is exerting on the inside of the wall of the blood vessel as the blood is moving through the blood vessel, okay? So that's what blood pressure is, but where did the pressure come from? Well, it comes from the contraction of the ventricles. When the ventricles contract, the right and left ventricle, it generates a force that forces the blood to go into their respective arteries. So if you remember blood flow through the heart, from the right ventricle, blood is going to go through the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary trunk. And that sends the blood into the pulmonary circuit. From the left ventricle, blood is going to go through the aortic valve into the aorta, which goes into the systemic circuit. So the contraction force of the ventricles is what is generating the force of blood to move through the vessel and thus puts a force on the inside of the wall of the blood vessel. Now, what determines whether or not that pressure is higher or lower? Well, one thing right away is how much blood the heart is pumping into the system. That's cardiac output. So if our heart can increase how much blood 
it's pumping into the system, your pressure is going to go up. It also is directly related to how much blood volume is in the cardiovascular system means something. Because I'll tell you right now, and you, it's a common theme we're going to learn through the semester, and you're, you're going to learn it quite well going into nursing school. Someone who is dehydrated, their blood volume drops. I mean, that's common sense. If you're dehydrated, you lose your blood, uh, water, right? Where's the water coming from that you're losing? It's coming from the blood. So when you become moderate to severely dehydrated, your blood volume drops and your patient would have a low blood pressure. Why is the pressure low? Because the blood volume dropped. That's exactly why as a clinician, you would hang an IV bag on that patient. Really for a couple of reasons. One, you want to replace their fluid and electrolytes, right? Rehydrate the body. But number two, by rehydrating the body and putting that fluid into the blood vessel, you're expanding the blood volume. You're expanding the blood vessel with more volume. And by putting more volume in the vessel, it gives the heart more volume to pump out. So if there's a, a good bit of volume in, in the system, the heart can pump it out, cardiac output. If you lose your blood volume, say someone's sick and they got severe diarrhea and they're vomiting or whatever they have, you're losing volume. So that decreases the volume the heart can pump out so their cardiac output would drop. And if cardiac output drops, the blood volume is dropping, blood pressure is dropping. So blood volume is directly related to blood pressure. If you increase volume, you increase pressure. If you decrease volume, you decrease pressure. It's that simple. Now, the other major factor besides cardiac output that affects blood pressure is resistance. Vascular resistance is the exact opposite pressure to blood pressure. So if blood pressure being defined by me as the force that blood exerts on the inside wall of a blood vessel, as the blood's moving through this vessel, it's hitting the inside of this wall that would be called blood pressure. The opposite force to that is resistance. So resistance, or what we call vascular resistance, is the force that is exerted from the inside wall of the vessel back against the moving blood. So blood's trying to get through here, it's pushing on the wall of the vessel. But at the same time, as the blood is pushing on the wall of the vessel, the vessel is pushing back against the moving blood. And so that is called vascular resistance. So this is a parameter that we're about to get into, all right, dealing with regulating blood pressure and how it affects blood flow through a tissue. All right, so, oh wait, I wanna show you this too before I move forward. So look at our, look at the blood pressure chart over here. If you were taking the blood pressure on somebody, which is an activity we would normally do in lab. So during this time in lab, if we were physically there, I would pull the stethoscopes out. Uh, we would pull the cuffs out, the sphygmomanometers and hook them up to people. And I would teach you how to do a blood pressure. It's not too terribly difficult. And probably many of you, already know how to do it, especially if you already work in a medical field. So, but the point here is this, when you take somebody's blood pressure, as you know, there's always two numbers, right? There's a top number and a bottom number. 120 over 80, that's kind of the textbook value, right? The 120 over 80 number. Well, the top number is always called the systolic pressure, and the bottom number is always called the diastolic pressure. The reason for that is because the highest of the pressures, which obviously is a top number, is the pressure, blood pressure that is generated when the ventricles are actively contracting. So that's during what we call their systole phase. The contraction phase of the heart is systole. So the pressure that's exerted while the ventricles are actively contracting is called the systolic pressure. So that generates the top number. 
but the bottom number of the blood pressure is called the diastolic, excuse me, the diastolic pressure, because that's the pressure of the blood inside the blood vessel when the ventricles are in relaxation, when they're relaxing, not contracting. And the name for the relaxation phase is called diastole. So we have a systolic pressure, we have a diastole.